The 10 Most Notorious Bank Robbers in History, Part 2 Before the advent of the computer and the internet, banks were the target of infamous outlaws, who subjected bank employees and customers to force, violence, or threat of violence, and got away with millions of dollars. In part one of this video, we narrated the life and adventures of five prolific robbers who terrorized the United States banking industry throughout the 20th century. Now in part two, we continue our countdown list with five legendary bank robbers in history dating back to the 19th century. Number five, George Nelson. George Nelson, popularly referred to as Babyface Nelson, was an American bank robber, considered one of the most violent bank robbers in history. Before his death, he had killed more FBI agents than any other person. Nelson was born Lester Joseph Gillis in December 1908 in Chicago. He first got arrested at age 12 after shooting a playmate with a pistol. After his release from juvenile detention, Nelson worked in a standard oil gas station in his neighborhood, during which he became an associate of the Irish-American mob, the Tui Gang. In January 1930, Nelson and gangmates invaded the home of corporate executive Charles Richter. They made away with $205,000 worth of jewelry, equivalent to $3.3 million in present-day value. Two months later, they carried out a similar robbery in the house of Lottie Brenner von Bulo. On October 3, 1930, he robbed the Itasca State Bank, making away with only $4,600, which was disappointing, as a previous bank robbery had also netted only $4,000. However, three nights later, Nelson stole the $18,000 worth of jewelry from Mary Walker Wise, the wife of Chicago Mayor Big Bill Thompson. She described her attacker, saying, He was a good-looking boy with a baby face, hence the nickname Babyface. Babyface Nelson was arrested, but escaped from prison a year later during a prison transfer. Nelson was more skilled in jewelry robbery than robbing banks, but not for long. He was introduced by a fellow gangmate to Eddie Benz, a notorious outlaw, who trained Nelson in the art of bank robbery. Together they robbed the People's Savings Bank in Grand Haven, Michigan, on August 18, 1933. The Grand Haven robbery marked the completion of Nelson's training, making him ready to run his own bank robbery gang. Two months later, Nelson recruited Homer Van Meter, Tommy Carroll, and Eddie Green, and robbed the First National Bank of Brainerd, Minnesota, on October 23, 1933. The operation netted $32,000, equivalent to $640,000 in present-day value. Nelson sprayed machine gun bullets at bystanders as he made his getaway, killing Special Agent W. Carter Baum and Detective H.C. Perrin and wounding Detective Al Hartman. The gang members parted ways, and Nelson moved to San Francisco. He recruited John Paul Chase and Fatso Negri for a new wave of bank robberies the following spring. On March 6, 1934, Nelson and his two recruits teamed up with the two most notorious bank robbers at the time, John Dillinger and John Hamilton, and robbed the first national bank in Mason City, Iowa, of $52,000, worth approximately $1,040,000 in present-day value. Though the gang had no official leader, it was referred to as the Second Dillinger Gang due to Dillinger's extreme notoriety. Shortly after, the gang brought in another famous bank robber, Charles Arthur Floyd, popularly referred to as Pretty Boy Floyd. On June 30, 1934, they robbed the Merchants National Bank in South Bend, Indiana, during which Nelson and Van Meter engaged the police outside the bank in a gun battle, while Dillinger, Pretty Boy, and the rest of the gang emerged from the bank with sacks containing $28,000. They brought three hostages with them, including the bank president. Police officer Howard Wagner was killed while Van Meter sustained a minor injury. Pretty Boy Floyd's criminal exploits had gained widespread press coverage. He was cheered by the public because he would burn mortgage documents during robberies, freeing many people from debts. By October 1934, Dillinger, Van Meter, and Pretty Boy Floyd had been ambushed by the FBI. Nelson was the only man standing and had become public enemy number one. At that time, Nelson and his wife wandered from place to place, mostly hiding in auto camps between Nevada and California. On November 27, 1934, while Nelson and his wife were heading towards Chicago in a stolen Ford V8, they caught sight of a sedan driven by FBI agents on the opposite side of the road. Both parties simultaneously caught sight of each other, and both made several U-turns. In the gun battle that ensued, Nelson killed two FBI agents, but received nine bullets. 
Still, Nelson managed to escape to a safe house on Walnut Street in Wilmot, Illinois, where he died later that evening. Number 4. Pretty Boy Floyd Pretty Boy Floyd was an American bank robber renowned for burning mortgage documents during robberies, freeing people from debts, and gained public support and widespread press coverage in the 1930s. Born Charles Arthur Floyd in March 1904 in Georgia, Floyd was first arrested for stealing $3.50 from a local post office. Three years after the post office incident, Floyd was again arrested for payroll robbery on September 16, 1925, in St. Louis, Missouri. He served over three years, six months in jail. The payroll master whom Floyd had robbed described him as pretty boy with apple cheeks. During Floyd's time in jail, he made acquaintances with other men in the Kansas City underworld, with whom he executed a series of bank robberies after his release. In May 1930, Floyd and partners robbed a bank in Sylvania, Ohio. Again, he was arrested in November and sentenced to 15 years in the Ohio State Penitentiary. He escaped shortly after. In November 1932, they robbed the Farmers and Merchants Bank in Boley, Oklahoma. On June 14, 1933, Floyd teamed up with Adam Reschetti, another bank robber from Texas, and robbed a bank in Mexico, Missouri, taking only $1,638. On August 9, 1933, Floyd and Reschetti struck a bank in Galena but made away only with $3,000. While driving across Missouri, unknown to Floyd or Reschetti, a convicted bank robber Frank Nash, accompanied by law enforcement, was being transported by train from Arkansas to Kansas City. Attempts to free Nash resulted in what would be known as the Kansas City Massacre, in which Police Chief Otto Reed, FBI Special Agent Ray Caffrey, and Kansas City Detectives William Grooms and Frank Hermanson were all killed. Pretty Boy Floyd was immediately declared public enemy number one, and the FBI quadrupled their efforts to arrest him. Floyd's operations with Reschetti didn't seem to be yielding much. On June 30, 1934, Floyd joined the 2nd Dillinger Gang to rob the Merchants National Bank in South Bend, Indiana, during which Nelson and Van Meter engaged the police outside the bank in a gun battle, while Dillinger and Pretty Boy Floyd emerged from the bank with sacks containing $28,000 and took three hostages, including the bank president. After the Galena bank robbery, Floyd, Reschetti, and their girlfriends, who were sisters, rented an apartment in Buffalo, New York. In October 1934, their car slid into a telephone pole in heavy fog while leaving New York. The two men had their companions accompany the tow truck driver to town while they waited by the roadside. The two men, dressed in suits and lying by the roadside, were identified by a motorist who reported to the nearby police department in Wellville, Ohio. Reschetti saw lawmen approaching and fled into the woods, while Floyd, in his violent nature, decided to engage them in a gun battle. Outnumbered and outgunned, Floyd eventually ran into the woods, but was pursued by police chief John Fultz and officers Grover Potts and William Irwin. Floyd drew his gun and counterattacked them during the chase, shooting Fultz in the leg and Potts in the right shoulder. Floyd ran into a cornfield in a neighborhood in East Liverpool, Ohio. The other police officers enlisted the help of East Liverpool Police Captain Chester Smith, who had been a sniper during World War I. It was Chester who dropped Floyd with two shots using a 32 caliber Winchester rifle. Pretty Boy Floyd was proclaimed dead on October 22, 1934. Destroying mortgage documents during bank robberies and freeing people from debts had made Floyd a hero to many, who referred to him as the Robin Hood of Cookson Hills. He was buried in Aikens, Oklahoma. His funeral was attended by over 40,000 people and remains the largest funeral in Oklahoma history till today. Number 3. Jim Clark Jim Clark was an American bank robber, a public enemy of the state of Kansas, and probably the man with the highest record of prison breaks in American history. Clark was born in February 1902 in Mountainburg, Arkansas. Though he had been arrested several times in his early years for minor offenses, his first major conviction was for burglary in March 1928. He was sentenced to five years in prison. Surprisingly, he was released after serving less than a year of the sentence. Clark immediately returned to executing robberies and was again convicted and arrested on June 17, 1932, for the theft of $47,000 from a bank in Fort Scott, Kansas, after recently escaping from prison in April for a similar crime. On May 30, 1933, Clark orchestrated a mass escape of 11 convicts from the state penitentiary at Lansing. 
he spent a few weeks hiding in Cookson Hills, Oklahoma. He later joined forces with fellow escapees Wilbur Underhill, Harvey Bailey, and Big Bob Brady. On July 3rd, they robbed a bank in Clinton, Oklahoma of $11,000 and another bank in Kingfisher, Oklahoma on August 7th. They started making plans to rob another bank in Brainerd, Minnesota, but didn't carry through as Bailey got arrested three days later. Then on October 6th, 1933, the rest of the men attempted to rob another bank in Frederick, Oklahoma, but the early intervention of law enforcement forced them to escape with only $5,000 from the teller's cages, missing an enormous $80,000 in the vault. After switching cars in Indiahoma, police discovered their first getaway car, found a detailed map of their escape route, and called ahead to authorities in New Mexico with a description of the armed robbers. They were arrested at a police checkpoint in Tucumcari, New Mexico, and returned to the state penitentiary at Lansing. On January 19, 1934, Clark again orchestrated another prison break, freeing himself, Brady, and five other inmates who worked in the kitchen. After laying low for about three weeks, they raided a bank in Goodland, Kansas for $2,000 on February 9th. Clark was shot in both legs by a police officer shooting from underneath a car. He spent about three months recovering from his wound. On May 9th, he robbed a bank in Wetumka, Oklahoma. On May 31st, he returned to and robbed the same bank in Kingfisher, Oklahoma, which he had previously robbed on August 7th. In early June, he robbed a bank in Crescent, Oklahoma, on June 20th, he returned and robbed the bank in Clinton, Oklahoma of $13,000, the same bank they had previously robbed of $11,000 on July 3, 1933. The following year, Clark was declared public enemy of the state of Kansas. Kansas Governor Alf Landon personally offered a $200 reward for his capture, as did the Kansas Banking Association. A special police unit was created for his capture, which finally tracked and arrested him on August 1, 1934. Clark was sentenced to 99 years in prison, but was released in December 1969 after serving 35 years. Ironically, Clark spent his last days working for a local bank as a parking lot attendant until his death in June 1974. Number 2. John Dillinger John Dillinger was an extremely notorious American bank robber and leader of the infamous Dillinger gang. He was a mentor to most of the biggest names in American bank robbery in the 1930s, including Babyface Nelson, Pretty Boy Floyd, John Hamilton, Homer Van Meter, Charles Mockley, Eddie Green, and many more who were all part of the Dillinger gang. In fact, when it comes to bank robbery, Dillinger's notoriety can only be rivaled by that of the legend Jesse James. Dillinger was born in June 1903 in Indianapolis, Indiana. He was frequently in trouble with the law from his teenage years, mostly for petty thievery and street fighting. In 1922, Dillinger, 19, was arrested for auto theft, which led him into the troubles that eventually forced him to enlist in the U.S. Navy in 1923, deserting a few months later. In 1924, he married Beryl Ethel Hovius, a waitress he had met at a party in December 1923 in Mooresville. Unfortunately, Dillinger could not hold a steady job to preserve his marriage, so he resorted to armed robbery. The same year, he was arrested for robbing a local store during which a victim was injured. After discussing the matter with the Morgan County prosecutor, Dillinger's father advised him to confess to the crime without retaining a defense attorney. They expected a lenient probation sentence. To their greatest surprise, Dillinger was slammed with a 20-year sentence. His father regretted his advice. His plea for leniency for his son fell on deaf ears. Upon arrival at the Indiana State Prison, Dillinger is reported saying, When I get out of here, I will be the meanest bastard you ever saw. Dillinger was embittered against society because of his long prison sentence. While in prison, he befriended seasoned bank robbers like Harry Pierpont, Charles Mackley, and Hover Van Meter, who initiated Dillinger into the world of bank robbery, though he eventually became their master. Dillinger became fascinated with Herman Lamb's robbery techniques, which he meticulously studied as the men planned heists that they would commit once released. Dillinger's father launched a petition to have him released and gathered 188 signatures, resulting in parole on May 10, 1933, after serving nine and a half years in prison. Before his release, Dillinger had already conceived a plan to enable the escape of the new friends he made in prison. His friends later executed the plan and escaped. On June 21, 1933, just one month after his release, Dillinger robbed his first bank, the New Carlisle National Bank of $10,000. On August 14, he robbed a bank in Bluffton, Ohio. 
Dillinger was arrested and taken to the Allen County Jail in Lima, Ohio. On October 12, 1933, three of the friends he had helped escape, Harry Pierpont, John Hamilton, and Hover Van Meter, impersonated Indiana State Police officers, landed in Allen County Jail, claiming they had come to extradite Dillinger to Indiana. When the sheriff, Jess Sarber, asked for their credentials, Pierpoint shot Sarber dead and released Dillinger from his cell. The gang executed dozens of bank robberies, accumulating over $300,000, equaling over $6 million in today's value. After committing a series of bank robberies, Dillinger planned a final job, to rob the First National Bank in Mason City, Iowa, estimated to yield $250,000, with which he intended to leave the country for good. The gang arrived in Mason City, Iowa on March 12, 1934. Eddie Green and Van Meter stayed the night at the YMCA building across the street and surveyed the surroundings of the bank, while the other five gang members spent the night at the Manley Hotel, just nine miles north of Mason City. At 2.40 p.m. on March 13, 1934, a dark blue Buick sedan stopped in the First National Bank in Mason City, Iowa. Six heavily armed men, Babyface Nelson, John Hamilton, Eddie Green, Tommy Carroll, Van Meter, and John Dillinger, all dressed in trench coats and fedora hats, stepped out of the sedan. Nelson and Carroll positioned themselves across the street, looking out to neutralize any intervention. Hamilton, Van Meter, and Eddie Green entered the bank, shooting into the ceiling and shouting orders. Dillinger stood guard in the doorway to supervise operations inside and outside, while John Paul Chase remained in the car, ready to drive off. The bank president, Willis Bagley, ran into his office and locked the door behind him. Van Meter sprayed bullet through the wooden door but missed Bagley. While Van Meter and Eddie Green cleaned out the teller's cash drawers, Hamilton accompanied the assistant bank cashier, Harry Fisher, to the vault. Switchboard operator Margaret Geeson Johnson crawled to the balcony and shouted for help. Babyface Nelson, standing right below, responded, You're telling me, lady? At the vault, Fisher dropped a bag of pennies, which Hamilton greedily bent down to retrieve, allowing the steel gate to close behind him and Fisher. Fisher started passing stacks of $1 bills through the bars to Hamilton. By that time, law enforcement had received the alert, but Officer James Buchanan and Police Chief E.J. Patton watched from across the streets, but couldn't do much as the robbers emerged with bank employees and customers as human shields, forcing them into the getaway car as hostages and making them stand on the running boards of the car. The vehicle was so loaded with hostages that it could only run at 15 miles per hour. As they progressed a few miles up Federal Avenue, Miss Minnie Payne, an elderly woman who had been taken hostage, suddenly cried, let me out, this is where I live. Dillinger ordered his men to let her out. Like a city bus, hostages were allowed to jump off the car at various stops. They expected to get $250,000, but because the shrewd teller handed stacks of $1 bills, they only made away with $52,000, equivalent to over $1 million today. Dillinger was very disappointed. Shortly after the robbery, Dillinger took refuge in Chicago, frequently visited a brothel, and became romantically involved with one of the girls, Polly Hamilton. The brothel was owned by Anna Ivanova, a Romanian immigrant who was facing deportation. Ivanova agreed to offer the FBI information on Dillinger in exchange for their help to prevent her deportation. She revealed that Dillinger, Hamilton, and herself would be visiting the Biograph Theater in Chicago in the evening of July 22, 1934. By 8.30 p.m. on the given date, a group of special agents led by Melvin Purvis had taken a position outside the theater. At about 10.40 p.m., Dillinger was sighted coming out of the theater, accompanied by the two women. Dillinger immediately suspected the presence of law enforcement. He quickly moved ahead of the two women and ran into a nearby alley, but was pursued by three special agents who opened fire when Dillinger reached into his pocket to get his gun. Dillinger was shot six times. He fell face flat and died. Dillinger's death came just two months after the deaths of Bonnie and Clyde. After being used by the FBI, Anna Ivanova was later deported to Romania nonetheless. As we get to the top of our countdown list, the most notorious bank robber in history, please hit the like button and subscribe to our channel for more videos on notorious outlaws. Number 1. Jesse James Jesse Woodson James was an American outlaw, bank and train robber, and leader of the James Younger gang. Even before his death, he had become a legendary figure of the Wild West. Jesse James was born in September 1847 in Clay County, Missouri. 
He was one of the many outlaws inspired by the insurgencies of ex-Confederates following the outbreak of the Civil War. On February 13, 1866, Jesse James, 18, and brother Frank James committed the first daylight armed robbery in the United States during peacetime, the robbery of the Clay County Savings Association in the town of Liberty, Missouri. On May 23, 1867, they robbed a bank in Richmond, Missouri, during which the mayor and two others were killed. A year later, the James brothers joined forces with the younger brothers, Cole, Jim, Bob, and John, to form the James Younger Gang. On December 7, 1869, the gang robbed the Davies County Savings Association in Gallatin, Missouri. James killed the cashier, John Sheets, mistaking him for Samuel Cox, a former militia who killed one of their comrades during the Civil War. It was the first time Jesse was publicly labeled an outlaw by Missouri Governor Thomas Crittenden, who placed a $5,000 bounty on him. The gang carried out a series of robberies from Iowa to Texas and from Kansas to West Virginia, robbing banks and stagecoaches, carrying out their crimes in front of crowds. On July 21, 1873, they derailed a Rock Island Line train west of Adair and stole over $3,000, valued at almost $70,000 today. On September 7, 1876, they attempted to rob the First National Bank of Northfield, Minnesota, but the acting cashier, Joseph Haywood, refused to open the safe, claiming it was secured by a time lock, even though they held a knife to his throat. As the assistant cashier fled through the back door, he was shot and wounded in the shoulder, causing the citizens of Northfield to raise alarm. The robbers fired into the air outside to clear the street as they attempted their escape, thereby causing the townspeople to fire back. Two of the gang members were killed while the other younger brothers were arrested. Only Jesse and brother Frank managed to escape. The James brothers fled to Missouri while Frank seemed to settle down and take a break from crime, Jesse recruited a new gang in 1879, robbing banks, stores, and trains. During that time, the Ford brothers, Bob and Charlie, who happened to be two of Jesse's new recruits, were secretly negotiating with Missouri governor to assist in Jesse's capture in exchange for their amnesty and the $5,000 bounty on Jesse. On April 3, 1882, after breakfast, Ford and James went into the living room to prepare for an upcoming robbery in Platte City, Missouri. As Jesse walked across the room, he noticed a dusty picture and climbed on a chair to clean it. Bob Ford immediately drew his gun and shot him from behind. The death of Jesse James became a national sensation. Though the Ford brothers were granted amnesty by Missouri Governor Thomas Crittenden, the increasing pressure from public sympathizers forced them to flee Missouri without collecting the full bounty. Charlie Ford committed suicide on May 6, 1884, while Bob Ford was shot dead on June 8, 1892 by Edward O'Kelly, an outlaw and Jesse James sympathizer. Thank you for watching and do well to check out our next video right here.